tonight. I'm Tim Long. I'm the director here at the Weezer Public Library. I'm so glad to see such a crowd come in for Kit's production tonight. So Kent Kaiser is coming to us today. Norma Dickerson, raise your hand. Norma. That is her grandson. He wanted that announced. So, um, Kaiser family is from Weezer. Uh, Kent is a history graduate graduate from Boise State. I guess that's okay. Um, Kent went and he took a job. He's going to teach history in Parma, where he is from. So, please welcome Kent, and I'm so hope, so glad you're all here. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Well, that uh, academic I spoke of is coming. He texted me at uh, 6.35 that he was almost here. Uh, incredible timing, I thought. So I figure by the time I get to the Battle of the Bulge in the story, uh, he'll walk in the door and I'll go right on time. That's perfect. Uh, so uh, we will give him a hard time, please. All right, if he walks in, that would make me happy. Uh, now... I'm calling this a story because I know uh, I'm a master's student and usually when you approach things like this as a history student, um, a lot of things seem to get sterilized in the minds of some people as if history is this thing, you know, that's just names and dates. Yeah, just uh, you'll read a book and then this happened on this date and these were the people involved and that's history. And that's not history, let me tell you. Uh, History is uh, the context of those names and dates, right? It's how those names and dates fit together and play with each other. And the living memory of that, well, that changes through time. I mean, the best thing about World War II veterans that I can figure out is that uh, their stories, when they get out of the Army, from what I'm at least reading from these guys, is uh, pretty boring. They want to they talk about anything. You know, it was this... Uh, if you were going to write a history book about what these guys talked about when they came back in 1946 and 1947, you would have the least interesting history book of all time. All right? But as uh, life goes on, sometime especially in the 1970s, a lot of these guys start opening up, uh, especially when they're writing letters to each other. And the, so the history that I have is actually the letters and the stories that they were telling each other. Uh, funny thing is, when I met, I got to meet the last living veteran of the 526 Armored Infantry Battalion, which by the way, this is the battalion this talk here is about. One of the things that was real hard uh, was to get him to tell stories with his family around. And it became pretty apparent that the only way that I was going to get him to open up about anything is if I got his kids and his uh, grandkids to leave. And it was just him and I. Yeah, so if, you, if your parents were in the military and they never talked about anything with you, uh, you're not alone. That seems to be the case just about everywhere. But apparently when it's their buddies that were in the service with them, or in some cases a strange college kid that just drove five hours to meet you, you will talk about it. Um, but it is a tough, it's a tough thing to talk about. Um, so the story that you're going to get is, I think, pretty cool. I think it has, you know, I don't know if anyone's read that Ambrose book, Band of Brothers. It has all that cool stuff that's in the movie and the books. But it also has a lot of dark stuff and some stuff that shatters some illusions about especially what young men who are growing up in the Great Depression who have a lot of obligations to the farm all of a sudden getting a draft notice and uh, not being happy about that. Turns out when you uh, have parents you got to help take care of in a farm, uh, the whole idea of patriotism that you see in the movie, not exactly ringing out in a lot of these guys because they're really scared about having to leave home after experiencing incredibly hard times in the 1930s. Well, look at that. He's walking right in. <laughs> All right, we got to think of something funny to say. Start clapping or something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big crowd. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, Thank yeah. Thank you for showing up. Yeah. <laughs> I know you. I know you. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, right on time. Well, I'll get you up here to talk about the bulk here. Um, so uh, I'm going to start right here on this first, uh, these first two panels and tell you about something that was developed right at the end of World War I. And that was this modern concept that light can be used as a weapon. All right, something straight out of a sci-fi movie or something. Uh, but it was, really wasn't that uh, impressive of a concept when you really break it down. The idea is if it's nighttime and you have an incredibly high beam light that is facing towards your enemy and they cannot see because they are momentarily blinded by that light, they are a lot easier to kill. All right. Well, the English first came up with that brilliant concept of mounting lights facing the en enemy positions in the First World War. And the idea was actually that they were going to be used to guard canals, where if an enemy ship came into a canal that was important, especially in South and Central America, that these lights could shine on them and it would just disrupt the direction of that ship. Uh, but the idea was, well, what if, what if you mounted them to something? Because right? uh, at first the idea was you put them in the ground and you face people or ships or vehicles and uh, the, then they just kind of drive by it and it, the light stops working. So the idea was, okay, well, what if, uh, what if we mount them on cars or trucks or tanks? And that's exactly what the British did. So, so throughout the 1930s, the idea was, well, we're gonna get these incredibly high beam lights and we're gonna start using them in new ways, manipulating. <laughs> that is the awkward <laughs> thing about this talk up here. Right? They walk in and you always feel kind of bad. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. The idea was you mounted these lights on these tanks or trucks and uh, the lights would actually flicker and a little bit faster than the human iris could actually adjust to. All right? and it would really screw up your eye. All right? So you would keep trying to adjust it over and over again and it was just a little faster than you were able to. Not too fast, just a little faster than the human iris is able to adjust to. And then they would flash colors. All right. Um, it's only red and blue at the time, but they ended up adding green later. And it would be a mixture of these colors, and these colors would make it so that the, the distance of that light was hard to at least comprehend from where you were standing. So the idea is this light's flashing, you're seeing it, you're seeing it, it's getting in your eyes, it's giving you a headache, you can't seem to adjust, and for some reason your depth perception is completely off. You can't tell how far away it is, how close it is. So the British started developing this in the 1930s, and then the Germans got this bright idea to go to war with the world. Uh, and uh, the British were like, okay, well, we're going to have to use this. So they gave them to the French, but uh, the French didn't exactly do well. So they, the idea was, okay, we're going to go over to the United States, and we're going to demonstrate to the new armored corps that's uh, being put together. Um, our old friend Patton over there championing the idea of the Armored Corps. And uh, we're going to demonstrate to these Americans that this light stuff has, a, has really good possibilities. And they did. So in 1942, they end up doing a presentation at Fort Knox. And it's a, it's a pretty genius presentation. And the idea was there would be a row of tanks with these lights. And there would be an opposing force. And the opposing force that was dealing with these tanks had, just had to do one thing. Accurately, accurately identify how far away the tanks were so they could call in artillery support. That's it. You just had to identify how far they were and if you could identify and get a, actually get a hit on them before they actually reach you, you win. And so the Americans are like, oh come on, we can do that. I can see how far away a light is. And it ended up being incredibly hard to the point within about 10 minutes, the American lines, the opposing lines, were entirely overrun with the British tanks. And the British were awfully cocky about that, I guess. <laughs> and that pretty much uh, convinced the Armored Corps and the US Army that they need to take this light thing seriously. So at Fort Knox, where that demonstration was at, they decided they would put together a special unit that would deal with these lights. And that unit was the 526 Armored Infantry Battalion. It was an independent battalion, not connected to any division. 
an independent battalion that was going to be directly, um, it was going to report directly to the the chief of staff of the European, or what, what do you call this? Uh, you know the word here. Shafe. Shafe. Why don't you explain it? You're the academic as well. Here. <laughs> Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. There we go. <laughs> He's helping. Eisenhower. Eisenhower, yeah. The big guy. And originally there was going to be the 525th and the 527th, but it ended up being only the 526th. There would only be one battalion of about a thousand guys. And a, the officer corps of this small battalion was mainly guys that were already in the army. So these guys were not from the west. There were people that were already in the army and had a little bit of experience. But the enlisted man, that was a different story. They needed to figure out who was going to be drafted because they were going to be drafted to be put into this special unit. And the idea that these uh, lights were actually going to be used in North Africa where there was open space and easy, <laughs> open space is easy for light to penetrate. Hopefully I'm not boring you too much out there. Quiet. All right. So turns out there's a really good region here in the United States that uh, is kind of uh, full of deserts. <laughs> a lot of sagebrush, a lot of guys have a lot of experience in rural life, and that was Idaho. So in March and April of 1943, a whole lot of guys from Idaho got drafted, and they got drafted together. And they were the first pool of guys from Idaho that were going to be tested to go into the 526th Armored Infantry Battalion. And here in Weezer, we have a couple guys that were drafted all together on the very same day. And that was John Sendon, W.D. Hurd, and Bill Kaiser. There was also a guy, Clarence J. Benson, and he was also drafted on the same day, but we will get to Clarence a little later. So the idea was they get drafted and then they have to take a whole bunch of tests. Well, in order to be in the 526th uh, Infantry, Armored Infantry Battalion, you had to score about 15 to 20 points higher um, on the U.S. Army's general classification test than the average U.S. Army soldier. And I guess Bill, my Uncle Bill did pretty good, W.D. did pretty good, Clarence did good, and so did John Sinden. They were all incredibly intelligent individuals according to the U.S. Army. So they sent them to Fort Knox. And then when they were in Fort Knox, they, well, gave them just about every type of medical exam and test that you can imagine, annoyed them, uh, apparently, from all the letters that I have. <laughs> and they kept telling them, that they weren't allowed to talk about what was about to happen because while they were in Fort Knox uh, they found out that they weren't really going to be in Fort Knox but according to their families they were in Fort Knox so any letters that were going to be sent home was Fort Knox though they were not again going to be at Fort Knox and uh, later in 1943 they do basic in uh, they basically do basic training there at Fort Knox and then after they do what is standard basic training, they're told they're going on a special train ride. This is about three months after getting enlisted or <coughs> drafted into the Army. And now, the 526, most of these guys were from the West, as I said, the enlisted men. <laughs> okay. Most of these guys uh, were from the West, and that meant uh, California, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, all right? And uh, some of them from Nevada and Utah. And so they saw the direction of the train, which was west, and I guess they were pretty happy about the direction of that train, feeling that maybe they were going home. And on that train ride, a whole lot of guys got the idea that maybe they were going to California. And uh, so they were pretty excited because at that time, the idea of going to California sounded pretty cool. So they were really excited until they pulled up in the middle of the desert, a place called Bows, Arizona, and they were incredibly pissed. Because <laughs> uh, Bows, Arizona is about 120 degrees in the summer, or warmer. It's dry desert. The town of Bows is much of a town at all. Uh, from the stories that I have of the people that visit Bows 50 years after it was a military facility out there, it still isn't very interesting. <laughs> so at the time, it was just mainly a bunch of rows of tents, these little wall tents. And right then, as they got into that base, they were sworn to secrecy. They would never talk about what they were going to experience ever in their lives. 
And most of them Aww. who get out of the army actually think that uh, they're still sworn to secrecy. But in the 1950s, it was all declassified. But a lot of these guys had no way of knowing that, and especially guys that were not really involved in the Veterans Association. So those poor guys pretty much took it to their grave and never spoke anything with anybody, which is, uh, which is kind of sad. But they wrote to each other. So they're in Camp Bouse, Arizona. And I'll talk a little bit about Camp Bouse because this, this is a fun time. This is a time where I have a whole bunch of jokes and do inappropriate things that they tell me in confidence and I just pretend I didn't hear. Uh, because when you put a bunch of guys out in the middle of the desert and you're not allowed to leave or talk about what you're doing with anybody else ever, there's a lot of fun things you can uh, do out in the desert. So some of the things that they did which I mentioned in my first talk, which I think is hilarious, was the boredom that they uh, apparently had out there pushed them to the idea that playing with live ammunition uh, in creative ways is a fun and not dangerous thing to do. And so uh, one of the first things that they did as a joke, apparently after only being there about a week, <laughs> all right, was uh, they, had these, they had these big wall tents, and it was incredibly hot during the day and incredibly cold at night. So the idea was, uh, before you went out and did any maneuvering or any type of training, uh, in the morning you would build up a fire, and at night you would come and light that fire for the night. Right? So you didn't have to do any of the hard work after getting off of a hard day's work. Well, it turns out if you put live ammunition in the wood, right underneath the wood, and the guys in the next tent light it, and you all know what's about to happen, uh, that that is a, a, apparently really fun. <laughs> really fun. And so that was what they uh, spent their time doing, was uh, pretty much blowing up these stoves and ruining many of them, and uh, just making people angry. <laughs> but in that story, I have a great one that uh, Gary Sendin told me about John's. Uh, Anyone know what uh, KP duty is? Oh, yeah. You want, you want to describe it for everybody back there? It was my worst 12 hours of my life. <laughs> 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 four years, or not 12 hours of It was the worst that I've ever been. <laughs> it was nonstop, hot, humid, and it's work. I mean, I mean nonstop. Dishes coming at you 24 7. <laughs> there you go. Well, so imagine you're in that position and you see the cooks and they're trying to cook pork chops and now see if I, I'm, I'm probably a lot like you is I just wouldn't say anything because I'm exhausted but John Sendon here from Weezer uh, well he was, uh, he was trained to be a butcher while he was in school, a young guy and I guess he was kind of mad at these cooks uh, they, were, they were doing it wrong, they were preparing the pork chops wrong and uh, according to Gary over there, I have the quote up here too in order to uh, stop them from, and I quote, murdering the damn things, <laughs> he took over, and uh, that uh, idea to take him over, that might have saved his life, because uh, luckily the, there was an officer from his company that was in there, saw him do it, and had him uh, changed over from being uh, in the HQ Intelligence and Reconnaissance com um, platoon to being a cook. He got the light into the deal. <laughs> Also, when they're out in that desert, they uh, did uh, something that we do, I don't uh, think we do much anymore, but uh, bare knuckle boxing out in the, this little ring, and they'd have competitions doing it, but that had to come to a stop because um, it's bare knuckle boxing, as you might imagine. And the other thing was shooting competitions. That was a big thing out there. Now, but what they're out there doing was testing these lights. And from all the stories that I have about these lights, is uh, the idea was that again there would only be a handful of tanks and they'd be in a line and then the infantry would come in behind them and the idea is you'd approach the enemy lines and the infantry would come out and rush the lines while these tanks were basically confusing them. It was a pretty simple concept uh, but they spend about three and a half months out there working on this very serious sworn to secrecy they're gonna go to North Africa and then we win in North Africa and the U.S. government, uh, apparently not having a lot of foresight here, didn't know what to do 
with this whole facility that they just created to fight in North Africa. Um, but they decided that, okay, we're not going to use the tanks anymore. We've wasted these guys' time, apparently. But we are going to use these guys as a, as a special intelligence unit because they, ha they already have been sworn to secrecy. They've already had to go through intense training. They've quite literally went through hell at Camp Baus. So we'll send them to Europe, and we'll make sure that they uh, are useful in the ETO. And as you guys know, in 1944, there's a big invasion. I don't know if any of you have ever heard about it. Normandy, that was kind of a big one. Uh, and the 526 are not involved in Normandy. From what I understand, and reading these guys, they're not happy about it. These guys basically came in early, around early February 1944 to Wales and then did nothing for about six months. They just waited and waited and waited. They had no clue. And the stories that I have from Wales, which isn't a lot because they didn't write much about it and they weren't much interested in it, was one, uh, they, they didn't get along with the English army very much. Um, they did, again, odd things like, I guess, stealing uh, the headlights out of <laughs> British jeeps and tanks every time they got a chance, which I think is an interesting move, I guess. Uh, and then, of course, uh, making fun of the tea breaks. That was something that they, they talk about a lot. I guess the tea breaks are a real thing. They really happen. And they thought that that was pretty funny. But then uh, D-Day comes, and they assume, this is after about six months, it's June now, 1944, and they assume that they're going to be involved, and they get loaded up on a ship, and they don't leave Wales. They stay. And they don't know why, and they were quite frustrated. And they have to go back on the land, and they wait another two months until finally, in August of 1944, they land in France to an apple orchard, which has absolutely no Germans on it whatsoever. And they are once again incredibly bored. And at this point, they've done a whole lot of training in the desert. They've waited a lot around for way too long in, there in the UK. And then they've come to a French, they've actually come to a uh, French apple orchard right off the beach to do, again, nothing. And at this time, the morale of these guys just drops through the floor. They're, they're not interested in what's going on. They don't know what they're meant to be used for. And supposedly, this is where they start talking about actually going AWOL and joining up with other divisions. Some of the guys were, the 2nd Armored Division, for example, was near them, and they knew that they were going towards some action, and so the idea that some of these guys had in the 526 was, all right, well, we'll just split away from this apple orchard, and we'll go try to join up with them, and if anybody here is in the military, you probably know that's not how that works. <laughs> uh, so they didn't do that. But, Things started to get serious in October of uh, 1944 because they got their first casualty. And they got their first casualty in a, in a pretty strange way. Uh, at this point, as I said, morale, real low. The guys in the 526 are actually, <laughs> they're told, okay, you're not going to go to the front for a little while. You're, you're too valuable to us, but we need you guys to clean up mines along the beach. <laughs> they didn't like that, obviously. Uh, but unfortunately, one of their guys ends up getting killed cleaning up mines. His name was Robert R. Sullivan from California. And he was good friends with a lot of Idaho guys. Um, again, full of Idaho guys. His best friend was a guy named Glenn Damron. And I have a cool little anecdote here about that. I went and met Glenn Damron's daughter, and she had pictures of uh, her dad and this guy, Robert R. Sullivan. And he said, oh, that was my dad's really good friend. And I guess he, he got killed. And I said, well, I'll do some research. And it wasn't that uh, long after that uh, I get a notification from a friend of mine who's a big collector 
And he goes, hey, you're not going to believe this, but there's a, there's a purple heart, a KIA purple heart that someone just found on an estate sale. Uh, I guess the guy's son, and he didn't have any kids. And it's to a guy named Robert R. Sullivan. You ever heard of him? And I go, well, yeah, I have heard of him. And I got a hold of the collector, and he shook me down for every cent I have, I will point out. But uh, I actually got that purple heart. And right after I got that Purple Heart, uh, I, you know, I, I called up uh, Glenn's daughter and I said, hey, you know, I got your friend's, uh, or your dad's friend's Purple Heart. I was real happy about that. And she said, well, I just found more pictures of Robert. I'm going to send them to you and you can have them because we don't really know Robert. And so, though it's not in this version of the uh, exhibit, in the other versions you'll see, especially the one that's going to be in Pocatello, which maybe none of you will see, but I'll take pictures. Um, that Purple Heart is there on display along with stuff from Glenn Dameron, so I think that was pretty cool. But Robert R. Sullivan was the first casualty, and they cleaned that beach up, and that beach is never used. Ever. Again, morale. I told you, this story, it, it gets cool, but the beginning of it, very, you know, they're very upset. This is, this is a very frustrated time. And uh, what I realized, you know, after I'm like studying this a little more is, this is the army. What I've experienced so far, this, this is the army for a great number of people. It's just waiting, having horrible things happening, and then not exactly knowing why or what we're supposed to be doing. So that's the mindset that these people are in at this point. All right, and this is September and October 1944. You can imagine, not, uh, not a good uh, mindset to be going into what's about to be an incredibly bloody battle ahead. Well, October and November of 1944, they get the opportunity, and they saw it as an opportunity, to finally leave that apple orchard after staying there for about two and a half, three months, and they're sent to Luxembourg. And while they're in Luxembourg, uh, a letter comes, and now this is, this is fascinating, because now this is going to get into the ooh, top secret stuff. Apparently, the U.S. government had been paying attention to them. They knew that they existed, and they did value them. But they did not have permission to use these guys as combat troops at all. Because these individuals were not just under American command. As it turns out, at Camp Baus, and many of them did not even know this, they were under joint British and American command. So where they went was dictated not only by Eisenhower, but by Winston Churchill himself. And in November of 1944, they got a letter that was sent to Luxembourg that was actually personally signed by Winston Churchill, which relinquished control and said, let's use these guys for the front and send them to Belgium, where they thought nothing was going to happen. I guess if the army tells you nothing is going to happen, you don't trust that, I guess. So uh, November 1944, there they are in Luxembourg, and uh, they're told that around January 1st, 1945, they're going to be sent uh, to Belgium. But something pretty big happens on December 16th, 1944, and that's why you're here, I hope. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what the Germans plan to do on December 16th, 1944. <coughs> and what their push was. Like me to I would like you to talk. We only really waited 35, 40 minutes for you. <laughs> well, you know, the Germans are in a really bad way at this point in the war. It yeah, looks... Speak up a little bit. The Germans aren't doing well <laughs> by December 1944. And, you know, the officer corps already tried to kill Hitler off. That didn't work and basically they're gonna fight to the end. But they have a plan, a desperate plan, which is, well, they're not doing well on the Eastern Front against the Russians, can't do much there, but they think they could maybe knock the Western Allies hard enough to make the Americans and the British somehow come to a separate peace. Then they could, then they could stop the Russians, right? So. That's all they've got left. And, well, they figured in the summer of 1940, they defeated the French by surprising them 
by attacking through the Ardennes forest with their tanks. When the French didn't think they possibly, no one could attack through a forest with tanks. It wasn't possible. They did it, they surprised them, they won in six weeks. So it's 1944, and they decided to do the exact same thing again attack through that forest, surprise them. And you think, how could the Allies be surprised by this? But they were. They were surprised by it. Well, you know, they could. They brought their tanks through the forest in the summer. You can't possibly do it in the winter. But they did, right? So that area of the front, sort of in the center, was weakly defended. And so new units arriving in the theater from the United States and Britain were sent to that part of the front. All the green units, the inexperienced ones, were sent there to acclimatize. And so they had no idea there was this giant buildup. Plus, they got a little cocky with, they were decoding all the German messages. So they thought they would, they would find out if the Germans were planning anything big. But the Germans were wondering about this why the Allies seem to know what we're doing. And so they decided not to use any radio traffic in organizing the offensive. All went by courier. So there you are, right? And some of you may have read the book, uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr., one of, uh, one of America's premier authors. Uh, he was in the 106th Infantry Division, which had just arrived from France, was put in that sector, and his division was overrun which was a rare thing to happen for the US Army in World War II, just destroyed. And he went into captivity, and he ended up at Dresden, and then was bombed by the Americans and the British while he was a POW. And that became his book, Slaughterhouse-Five. You know, there's, there's aliens from outer space in the book, and there's all kind of other stuff in there, but you have to read it, trust me. <laughs> He's trying to explain his experience, his weird experience. So that sets it up, ultimately, for the 526, because this offensive happens on December 16th. It's a huge surprise, and they are they have broken through. Now what do they do? So the idea of the Germans, see I'm a little nervous. This is way more people than I thought. Yeah. So you guys like walked in, I was like, I was like 10 maybe. You know, that'd be nice. So I, I feel warmed up now. So the idea was that the Germans would break through through the towns, the big towns here that everyone knows, Bastogne, famously, right? But also, that whole area from Malmody to Bastogne, you see this little wedge, and it would actually split the English and the American armies, and it would make them a hard move to Antwerp and to what they were hoping was going to be a pretty quick victory by securing Belgian and Dutch ports, right? By successfully splitting the contact between the English and the Americans, and also getting those ports, that is a pretty big blow. And at the time, when they make their attack, it looks like it's gonna happen. Especially given the, the 106th Infantry Division, and this is a big point. Everyone knows the biggest surrender of American troops, Baton Death March, that whole thing, we all know about that. Okay, the second biggest would be the 106th Infantry Division. As Dr. Walker pointed out, completely green. They just got off the boats, just got sent there, no combat experience, and they just got steamrolled by some of the best that the Germans had to throw at them. So, there's another big problem here. <laughs> By this point in the war, the Germans are very, very, very short on gasoline. They need fuel. They need it. And what do you think the Americans have piled up everywhere behind their lines? Fuel. So the idea that even though they don't have the gasoline, they could use American fuel depots and just ride, keep pushing through, that seemed realistic. And you have to understand that if you're in this position, because we know the Germans lose, right? I'm happy about that. But <laughs> at this time, as you, as you guys might imagine, as an American soldier, right, in the 526, you're not exactly happy about your experience in the war. 
you've already been pretty demoralized, and you just hear about this, and it looks to you that the entire front's falling apart, you might now, hopefully, understand why this is such an important time for the U.S. Army, especially the 526. They're not, they're not incredibly gung-ho, they're incredibly nervous, they've never seen combat, and so far their experience in the Army has not been great. So, on December 16th, the U.S. Army gets basically steamrolled on the front, and the 12th Army Group gets notifications that they need to have a response team. And the 12th Army Group is told that there's a big attack, but they're not going to continue much further. This, this is a localized, <laughs> I quote, a localized event. And so they have a special unit that's been trained as armored infantry to move fast, right, <coughs> to be able to rough it out. And that's the 526 Armored Infantry Battalion. And so for the first time, they are mobilized, and they are sent to where the U.S. Army and the 12th Army Group thinks matters most, which is this little line along the Amblay River in Belgium, where the towns of Malmedy, Stavlo, and Troy Pont all sit along this river. And behind it is one of the largest fuel dumps that the Army has. The Germans are already at the river. So in only a couple hours, the idea is that the 526 is going to get there, and they're going to hold that river until the rest of the army, which is kind of, this is a lot to be putting on a thousands guy's shoulders, that the rest of the US Army is going to pick themselves up, reorganize, and finally hold the Germans back. And ah, now we got to the good stuff, huh? Not so boring. So through, they leave roughly in the middle of the night on December 17th, and they get there in the middle of the night on December 18th to the town of Malmody, Stavlo, and Troy Paul. And that's what we're going to talk about, and I'm going to talk about the experience of all three of the main guys from Weezer that I have the most information on, and maybe color in what these guys had to go through. So first, little town of Malmody. Has anyone ever heard of that town, Malmody, before? You've heard of it? A big thing happens in the town of Malmody hours before the 526 gets there, and that's where roughly, it's about 80 prisoners, right? 80 American POWs are killed by SS troops. They're murdered. Uh, they were taken prisoner, put in an open field, and shot down. So as you might imagine, the situation's not looking good in the town of Malmody. And now I can go into a little bit of a story time. In the middle of the night, B Company, A Company, and HQ Company are at crossroads, and their commanding officer at the time, which is uh, Major Solis, who was under uh, Lieutenant Colonel Irwin, basically makes the rash decision that A Company will be sent to Stavlo, which is south of Malmody. B Company and HQ Company, which is the largest, that's going to be the largest group, is going to be sent to Malmody because that's near to the fuel dump, and they imagine that's where the Germans are really trying to go. And then they get one anti-tank gun squad. This is only 12 men and a half-track driver, so 13 in all. Is sent to cover a bridge at Troy Pump. And as I have told you, apparently when in these situations, when people make quick decisions and they say, I'm pretty sure the Germans are trying to attack here and not there, you can already assume that the place they sent the most guys is the place where they're going to see the least amount of action. And unfortunately, where they sent the least guys is where they're going to get hit the hardest. So at about 4.30 in the morning, WD heard from Weezer and a guy named Lincoln Mahaffey, who's a half-track driver, and he's from Kennewick, Washington, started to pull into the town of Malmody. And Lincoln told me maybe the most terrifying thing I have, I have ever heard. He said it was colder than anything he has ever experienced. Uh, they had never seen combat even once. They had no idea what to expect. 
The only thing that they had been told is that the line, lines have fallen apart. And there's only about 400 of them that are going into this town, and they don't know what to expect. They've also been told, now here's a part of history that you're not going to hear, is that the town of Malmedy is ethnically German, meaning though it's in Belgium, they are not exactly friendly with the rest of Belgium, nor with the Americans. So they're told that the, uh, the Allied troops are not going to be respected well and that they should watch out. And so Lincoln said he knew this going in there, and Lincoln was in the same half-track from what I understand as W.D. Hurd. And he said that they came to a fence line only a couple hundred yards, maybe a hundred yards, according to him, outside of the city, right, where, where it really started. And he said all of a sudden, ringing through just dead silence, right, in deep snow, bells started ringing all the way around the city. And they were told that it was German sympathizers that were warning the Germans that the first half tracks had, had entered into the city limits. And they stopped right then and there and they dug in next to this little fence post and right then they got to experience the first bit of combat. It was actually W.D. Hurd and a handful of other guys that earned their combat infantry badge earlier than the rest of the 526 by getting hit uh, roughly only about 15 minutes after they stopped uh, by German troops. And weirdly enough, though they're completely outnumbered, the 526 are only a handful of half tracks that even got into the city, right, with B Company being one of the first. The Germans leave, and they don't know why. Because in that moment, the Germans could have taken them very, very easily. But they leave. And Lincoln says he doesn't understand what happened or why. But all of a sudden, the Germans left. And they just sat there in these half-dug foxholes, hiding behind a half-track, trying to figure out what was going to happen. And now I'm going to switch forward to what's happening. And now I'll get to talk about my own Uncle Bill. A company was sent to the town of Stavlo. Stavlo is here south of Malmody. And there's only about 250 of them that go into that town, between 200 and 250. Supposedly, there was going to be a company of tank destroyers that was going to meet them there, but people get lost and the full number never really shows up. As they go into the town, it's almost completely empty. And I wish there was good photos of this town because from all the accounts that I have, because there are written accounts, as you can imagine, it's late at night, you're absolutely terrified, and your half track is going over these cobblestone streets, all right? And it's echoing, it's echoing down the streets. And they come to a bridge, which is where they were told to stop. And it's silent. And they all jump out. And roughly about 20 or 30 of them are told to cross the bridge. Not a fun job, not a job I would want to do. And uh, Uncle Bill was not one of the ones that had to stay across for very long, so good on him. But they cross the bridge and are told to go up a hill, which is right on the other side of the bridge, and to just see what's going on. And as they cross the bridge, they don't get very far. It turns out the Germans were sitting there waiting for them, expecting that they were going to send a response for us. And it wasn't Malmody that they were going after. It was Stavlo. The bridges in Stavlo uh, were big enough for tanks, German tanks, to go over. So the idea was it was important that they hold them and not let the Americans blow those bridges. From the memoirs that I have, the men that go into Stavlo and the 526, like my Uncle Bill, wanted to blow those bridges up so bad, but did not have the resources to do so. There was army engineers, this is a scary story, there was army engineers that were already there trying to blow that bridge and multiple times they tried to detonate it 
and not a single time it went off. There was a reason they didn't go off, and we will get to that. They cross the bridge and immediately get fired at. All of them rush back across, and in the chaos, a really interesting account is given by the medic that was uh, there in A Company, and his name was Alan Breed. And he said that as these men came back across the bridge, getting shot at from every conceivable direction, trying to just get out of there alive, the half-tracks come across, and then a jeep that they had never seen before follows the half-track. And they're medics, American medics. And they're, they're wearing their, you know, they have the Red Cross, and they're not wearing any helmets. And he doesn't understand why, and he flags them down, in the middle of the chaos as they drive up the street screaming at them because they know they're about to take heavy casualties and they're going to need those medics. And he runs up to them and they look at them completely blank expressions and they don't seem to understand them. And then they drive off in a hurry and that's when Alan Breed realizes <coughs> that in their own ranks there are Germans wearing American uniforms, including the engineers who couldn't seem to blow that bridge. So, pretty much knowing that they're completely overrun, they come up with what I think is the most hilarious thing on earth. The, uh, the A Company men were in a really, really good situation where it was too dark for the Germans to see the other side of the bridge, and it was too dark for the Americans to see on the other side of the bridge. So neither side could see each other, except if you cross the bridge. So. Both of them assumed that the other side had way more than they had. Now, the 526, the A Company men, they especially knew that they probably did not have as many as the Germans had on their side of the bridge. So they came up with something that sounds like I'm making it up, and I'm not, I swear. Uh, but they break down a, a wooden door that was on a shed in a house in Stavlo, and they break down the planks and in groups is three, and I, I'm sure Uncle Bill must have been one of them. They laid, a, they laid along the cobblestone, and in groups of three, they run it over it, back and forth, run it over, back and forth, in groups of three. And the sound of that wood on the cobblestone echoes across the bridge, making the Germans think that they're getting reinforcements to the front. There's more troops. They do that for three hours. <laughs> and then dawn hits, and the Germans realize that uh, they've just been fooled for a while now. And that's when the Germans hit them incredibly hard. And they take extreme casualties. Uh, first, they, from what I understand, they actually send an artillery barrage, and that's what gets my Uncle Bill. He earns a, a purple heart on that little bridge. Uh, artillery, uh, some, a bit of shrapnel seems to go through his thigh, but I don't know what thigh. It's in the, do, you, do you know what thigh? It's in the paperwork that he gets hit in the thigh. And he gets dragged out uh, by one of the medics, but doesn't get to leave the town because there's nowhere to go. <laughs> After the artillery barrage, German tanks rush across the bridge, and maybe the most hilarious and hilarious given the circumstance. The situation happens when a 526 man in A Company from California named Lee Galloway takes out a bazooka and shoots a German tank that's, uh, that got into the town center far across the bridge. And this is an odd story. The tank, as you guys know, German tanks are kind of known for their armor, so a bazooka hit in the front armor plates are not going to take out a German tank. But it turns out that, that <laughs> a great stroke of luck, that German tank, uh, the driver was trying to shift to a different gear. And he got hit right in the middle of it, and it broke the transmission and pushed it back. So the, the tank got stuck in reverse, basically. <laughs> and it went into a building, and the building caved over on it. <laughs> and the best part about this is while everyone is screaming, yelling, Explosions are going off everywhere. They're being overrun. Lee Galloway, this guy in A Company, is going, did you guys see that? <laughs> and it's, it's kind of funny because when I'm reading this stuff, 
these guys are in like the most stressful situation you guys could imagine, and yet they're still kids. You know, they're, he gets excited taking out this tank, uh, even though chaos, absolute chaos is going on around him. It's, it's kind of absurd to read about this. And then another interesting situation happens where, as I said, Uncle Bill, he was wounded. A lot of other guys were wounded too. It turns out the guys in Staff Low, most of them get wounded. The casualties are extremely high, but the Germans get across that bridge in no time. Uh, the anti-tank guns they have are, are no match by any means, and most of them get taken out as soon as dawn hits. The artillery barrage on an anti-tank gun isn't a good thing. Well, as they get overrun, the Germans in the chaos try to take a couple prisoners, including a medic uh, named uh, Leatherman. <coughs> All right, he becomes a doctor after the war, but um, <laughs> medic, the medic uh, Leatherman from California ends up getting captured by the Germans and they see that he's a medic, and they try to use him to load POWs, wounded, wounded POWs, and wounded Germans into a back of a half-track. He agrees. He loads up a bunch of his own guys, possibly my Uncle Bill. I really don't know. It seems to be that the medics get completely broken apart. But uh, Le Leatherman loads up all these wounded 526 guys as the Germans cross the bridge and they're telling him to load more, and they tell him, apparently, if you ever take a prisoner and you guys ever expect to go to war, don't do this. They tell him that he can drive. They put him in the driver's seat, <laughs> and they expect him to go across the bridge to the German side, and he goes to the American side. <laughs> and he, earns, uh, he actually earns a bronze star doing that, which is pretty incredible. Uh, and he took some uh, German prisoners as well doing that because there was some German... Uh, wounded soldiers as well. So, as you guys might imagine, the fight in Stavlo is absolutely chaotic, and it falls apart. The whole town uh, falls into German hands pretty quick, and the 526 men, roughly about 200, 250 of them, get out, and they break apart. Uh, they're, they, they're not reformed and reorganized into a, like a, a coherent company for about two weeks or three weeks to tell you how rough this is. They break apart. Some of them go to Malmedy. Some of them try to go south. Some of them just go straight west to a little town called Gliza. But about 30 of them get this idea that if the Germans are going to break through and the lines are going to collapse, we can't let these Germans get, we can't let them get the gasoline. So just a little bit north of Stavlo is a ginormous fuel dump. Yeah, this is where this is a big thing here. These 30 men jump in to a half track, and I don't know the names of all of them. I know the names of exactly two, unfortunately. Harlan Baker and Captain Charles Mitchell. That's what I have for sure. They get the idea that they're going to go blow up that fuel dump and make sure that the Germans can't get it. And they get into a half track, they drive up the road, they know the Germans are advancing on them. And uh, the stories here, all right, they kind of change because this ends up getting put into a movie. And it ends up that every guy in the 526 was apparently there after that movie comes out. Uh, so it's, it's a very confusing thing about what exactly happens here. But from what we understand, um, when they show up, these 30 guys, they notice that there was a couple of Belgian soldiers uh, that were trying to burn the fuel dumps as well, but they weren't doing a good job. And that some of the fuel had already been um, evacuated. And so what they do is, and this is great, uh, they try to light it with uh, these Zippo lighters, and it turns out that doesn't work in the middle of winter. And one guy, and the guy who supposedly comes up with this idea is named Harlan Baker. It's how I know. He gets the idea, well, what if we just shoot them? And he grabs a Thompson submachine gun, and he lights up back and forth uh, these rows, these long, long, long rows of gasoline. And that does the trick. That absolutely does the trick. And there's this great photo that I was able to find. Because they blow this, this ginormous dump, and they make sure that the Germans can't get it. And nobody believes them. <laughs> nobody believes these guys did it until one of them actually is able to get a, a photo 
of them in the middle of the action. And right there is Harlan Baker doing exactly what he was saying he was doing. They, uh, they blow that fuel dump and get the heck out of there. And because they blow that fuel dump, the Germans are not able to take advantage of that fuel. They're not able to advance, thankfully. Now this is a huge thing. Uh, the 526, they, they never get recognized for, for any of that, uh, ever, uh, and for most of their lives at least. Finally, it was in uh, <laughs> 2005 that Vice President uh, Dick Cheney met with them for like an hour and thanked them. They weren't happy about it, actually, <laughs> but uh, they got noticed for the first time. and. Uh, if you, when you guys get a chance to come up here, you can see that they finally got their, uh, they finally got their moment. But in 1965, a very famous movie movie comes out called The Battle of the Bulge. And in there, there's a scene where they're quickly trying to destroy a fuel dump, and you know, they they throw the fuel around, they spark it on fire, and the, these German tanks roll up and try to go through the flames, but they can't because the flames are too big. That part's not exactly true. But uh, the 526 guys, your dad, your dad, your dad, your brother, watched the, probably watched this movie in 1965. It was like, wait a minute. That was me. And uh, they never get credit. In the movie, it's like these fictional characters that do it, you know? They, they, nev they never get credit. Uh, in fact, almost every 526 man, besides just a handful, dies before they ever get credit for what they actually did there. Now we're going to move on to kind of the, the end, and I'll do a quick story about W.D. Hurd, because I've, I've got to learn so much about W.D. Hurd, and I, I would love to talk more about him. But uh, Troy Pont is south of Stavlo, and Troy Pont in French means three bridges. So there are three bridges in Troy Pont, three bridges that the Germans were interested in. So while, remember I told you that story about how in Stavlo they're running over these planks and trying to hold the Germans back for a little while? Well, the Germans thinking that, okay, maybe we can't take Stavlo, tried to go around to a little town called Troy Pont. And do you guys remember at the very beginning uh, how many people I said were holding that little bridge in Troy Pont? 13. There were 13 soldiers that were supposed to hold that bridge. They got there, um, and now, now I'm going to switch to a Pocatello guy. No Weezer here, but I got to talk about him. And his name was Ralph Baker from Pocatello, and he was part of that 13. And they got to these bridges, and they found that there was a group of army engineers which were trying to blow the bridge. No Germans in these army engineers, supposedly, so that was good. <laughs> but they were told that, okay, we're going to try to blow these bridges. Take your single anti-tank gun, position it at about 200 yards in front of the bridge on the other side, and if you see a German tank, fire. That'll be the, the signal to us that we just need to blow it with what we have on it now. Not a great plan for the people that are stuck on the other side of the bridge, uh, but, you know. Well, they realize that that's not a great plan for the guys that are stuck on the other side of the bridge. So they try, the squad leader tries to come up with his own way of making sure that they are not left on the other side of the bridge. And so what that plan was going to be was they were going to take two volunteers that were not volunteered. <laughs> um, <laughs> And they were going to send them up another 200 yards, and they would lay uh, some anti-tank mines in a daisy chain across the road. These would not blow up a German tank by any means, but it would make an explosion. That would say, okay, there's German tanks. Let's get on the other side of that bridge and tell them to blow it. That was the idea. Well, the two people that were volunteered to go was a guy named Francis Frazier from Washington, and a guy named Ralph Beaker from Pocatello. Ralph and Frazier were not exactly happy about being volunteered to do this job. So their squad leader said, 
All right, what we'll do is we'll take the half track. I'll drive it. We'll go up that 200 yards. You guys lay down the tank mines and then run back to the half track and then I'll get you out of there. So, you know, you don't need to worry. Make, that would make me feel a little better, huh? <laughs> Turn, not if your squad leader is not exactly the most courageous fellow, though. That's what we find out. So, what ends up happening is as they go, uh, the squad leader does exactly what he, what he said he would do. He would drive that half track. You, you notice I'm leaving the squad leader's name out. That's how you know he really did something wrong, right? <laughs> uh, he drives up there just like he says. He parks it. He waits. Ralph Baker and uh, Francis. Frazier, they jump out, they run out there, and right as they put down the first landmine on the daisy chain, they look up, and there was already German tanks coming down the road. They scream. Uh, basically, the, a tank ends up opening on them uh, with machine gun fire, uh, with one of the machine guns that was mounted. And uh, they run back to the half track, and it's not there. <laughs> uh, their squad leader assumed that they, he, uh, they were killed, actually from the machine gun fire, and he left them. And he ran back. This, this is an incredible story, honestly. Uh, according to Francis and Ralph, the squad leader goes back to the rest of his squad where the anti-tank gun is, and those German tanks are able to spot him because obviously the half-track is driving right to them in an open field, and uh, the German tanks take out the entire squad and only a couple shots. The engineers obviously get the cue that, okay, we probably need to blow that bridge. They do it, it works, but two men are stuck on the other side, and that was Francis Frazier and Ralph Beaker. Luckily, Ralph wrote down everything that he experienced, and I, have, I actually have his written memoir in his handwriting of what he did. And so the story goes, and I'm gonna I'll abbreviate it a little bit, you know, I don't want to hold you here all night, is that they realized that there was no way they were getting back across that bridge, and they understood that their entire squad was, was killed. Um, and in fact, they heard some of the guys yelling and assumed that they couldn't go and do anything for them. And they got down into the river, and they laid against the banks of the river for about, what I understand, about 20 hours. And you have to understand that it's below freezing, incredibly cold, one of the coldest winters that they'd had in some time over there in Belgium. Yeah. There's snow everywhere. And the story that I have from Ralph is that they, they sat there early in the morning with a candy bar that was from a K-ration box and passed around a single cigarette. Yeah. Ralph was LDS, by the way, so <laughs> he... Uh, <laughs> He turned to smoking real quick in this situation. Uh, they passed around that cigarette, and they stayed in that water, and they saw the Germans, and they didn't say anything. They just waited, and waited, and waited, till roughly about midnight, right? So now it's the next day, nearly, or a little past that, one, two in the morning. And they get up, and they learn that uh, Francis, this should be kind of obvious what I've just described, he, he's frostbitten pretty bad. And he's not able to run real well. And so Ralph helps carry him to a, a little farmhouse where they found a, a, Belgium, a Belgian couple, an old farmer's uh, couple, an old farmer couple um, that was living there. And they were sympathetic to the Americans, but they had to convince them that they were Americans. And the story goes that he sat there for like an hour and a half trying to just convince them that we're Americans and that you don't need to worry and this isn't a trick and finally they're uh, they're actually uh, convinced even though they don't speak a lick of English and uh, the guy from Idaho and Washington obviously don't speak uh, French or Walloon or any Flemish or whatever the Belgians are speaking here and uh, they stay in that house where they're nursed back to health basically for about two days Though the stories kind of jump around, because sometimes he says two days, sometimes he says three or four days. But he says that they had nothing. This couple, they had no food. Uh, they had bread that was made, very, very coarse bread, and some butter. And that was about all the food that they had. And they shared that with them. 
And then after a couple days where they figured they could walk, uh, they snuck away without telling uh, the couple. And they did that because they didn't want to get the couple in trouble if the Germans did uh, find them. They really would have no idea what happened. And at this time, uh, Ralph actually heard during the day while they were laying in the, in the uh, stream or in that river, they actually heard the sounds of the fighting in Stablo. And they assumed that everything was over, that the American lines collapsed entirely. And what ends up happening is, this is a strange part of the story. Uh, they're walking along that river trying to see if they can find any way to get to the other side. And all of a sudden, an American jeep drives up from a very beat up looking individual from the 30th Infantry Division. And he's lost uh, and scared. And he was in a very similar situation where um, he got lost and separated from his unit on the wrong side of the river. And he approaches them. And they wave him down. And the first thing out of Ralph's mouth, apparently, is, do you know what happened to the 526? Uh, and he goes, I, I don't know what the 5, I've never heard of the 526. Uh, and he tries to describe the, the fellas um, that were holding that bridge. And he says, oh, they're, they're gone. That, that, old, that old group, they've been annihilated. They've, they've broken up throughout the entire area. And he asked for a ride back, which is what I would do as well. <laughs> and uh, they get into the vehicle, and there was a, a dead American and a dead uh, German sitting in the back seat. And uh, this is a real strange thing. And I guess he was trying to get the American's body back. It was his commanding officer. And so he didn't toss the body. And this is a great part of uh, the story that really tells you the brutality of what these guys are going through. According to Beaker, in addition to the driver, the Jeep contained the bodies of a dead German and a dead American captain. The driver told him, if you want to ride, you can sit on the German, but not the captain. <laughs> so sitting on the body of the German soldier, Beaker and uh, Francis Fraser held each other and were driven back across the American lines. But they did not find their unit because it had been pretty much annihilated for about a month. So their family got, uh, in Pocatello actually, I actually have a copy of the telegram, they were told that they were probably killed in action. And uh, about a month later, the story goes that they were, they were in Malmody, where they get regrouped, and they see a, a little uh, 520, 526 on the side of a Jeep. And they jump off, they go AWOL, the division they were put in, and they go back to the 526. Frazier, um, he ends up getting his, uh, one of his feet amputated, unfortunately. But he does, he survives and he gets sent back to Washington and he lived there to the end of his days. Uh, he died in the early 2000s. Ralph, he lived as well. Um, Ralph, uh, he actually stays with the 526 somehow, and I have no idea how. Um, apparently he thinks maybe the cigarette had something to do with it, I don't know. He, uh, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't get frostbite bad enough that anything had to be amputated. He actually stayed with the 526 the remainder of the war. And he came back to Pocatello and raised a family and he passed away in 2002 and he's buried there in Pocatello. And his family's still around. Now, there's all kinds of stuff about the 526. It doesn't really end there, but I'm going to end it there for the most part. Except I'm going to talk about something that you will not find in any history books. And you won't find any of this in any history books except this is the only academic work that has ever been done on this, uh, this unit, the 526. It was a master's thesis done by a guy named Tom Hanchett, who is a friend of mine. Um, but unfortunately, these guys have kind of been lost to time. And you can see part of the reason they were lost to time was because they were sworn to secrecy from the very beginning. And the other, the other part is because their big experience in war was horrible, chaotic, and they got broken apart almost immediately. But they had a huge impact on the, on the Battle of the Bulge. I mean, they burned the gas depot and helped stop the Germans at Stavlo, right? In fact, they, they had a song, uh, at Malmedy, the Germans had their spree, and at Stavlo, we said, hell no. <laughs> That's what they said. Uh, they were able to actually stop the Germans that advance for the Battle of the Bulge for near 12 hours. Just about a thousand guys did that. And that's pretty impressive. I'm not saying that the Germans were going to win the war 
if the 526 wasn't there. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that there would have been a lot more lives lost, and I think the history about the Battle of the Bulge would have been a heck of a lot different. Now, the thing that happened, which is kind of the darker side here, is that there's only two companies that are left. Because um, A Company gets taken apart. There is actually a C Company, but that gets removed from the 526 incredibly early on. So that's why it's not discussed. HQ and B Company, which would be John Sendon's company, HQ Company, and then WD's company, B Company, are the only ones that are really left. And on, uh, right after, you know, the first part of the Battle of the Bulge, Malmody and Stavlo, in January 1st and 2nd, 1945, uh, they are actually um, reorganized quickly, HQ Company and B Company, and they are told that they're going to go on a a little, uh, a little mission, something small, that's not going to hurt anybody, apparently. That wasn't true. Um, HQ Company and B Company stay in the town of Malmody the entire time, and the Germans do come back eventually. Uh, in fact, John Sennon was shot uh, his left hand. He gets shot while he's in Malmody. And a lot of the other guys end up getting uh, shrapnel from Mal in Malmody because of artillery barrages and the, the U.S. Army Air Corps accidentally bombs the city of Malmody while uh, these guys are around Malmody and in Malmody. So this is rough. But on January 3rd, my birthday, so that's cool, I guess, <laughs> um, B Company is separated out, W.D. Herg's company, and they're told that they need to go take a little hill called Hooyer Hill, and they're told that this is a this is a small this is a small little ob German observation point that they're using they think to direct artillery on the town of Malmody. Easy enough. They said even though there's not there's not much cover, they should be able to walk across the fields and take out this observation point, especially if they can get some uh, half tracks or a tank that can come up later from a different division, which they said that they would plan out. Well, there's something really scary about this. Um, I never, I didn't actually talk much about this part. I don't believe I brought this story up at all at the last exhibit. I don't believe. So this is new information for some of you. Uh, I, I mentioned the Malmody massacre, uh, where about 80 POWs are killed right before the 526 gets there. Well, as they're going to take Hooyer Hill, they're walking across these fields, and they walk right over the bodies. They don't know it. They walk right over the bodies of the Malmody uh, massacred POWs. Even though some of them mentioned that they saw bodies in some of the memoirs uh, and written statements that they actually did know that they were walking on something. And apparently a lot of them felt that this was a warning for what they were about to experience, which ends up being the hardest part that the 526 ever has to experience. And that's when the 526 B Company come to this little thing called Hooyer Hill, and they find out that it was a rendezvous point for an entire German division. Mm -hmm. And it was, in fact, not a small observation point, and that roughly 200 guys was not going to take this hill. So with roughly no cover except small little fences and some shrubs that were running the side of the hill, right, these little stone fences, they walked up that hill. Uh, and pretty much got annihilated. Near, near everybody in that company uh, was wounded, captured, or a handful of them that did survive. And uh, I got to talk to one of the few men that survived, which was Lincoln Maheffy. And uh, so I can tell you a little bit about what happened that day. Uh, now, my friend Tom Hanchett, that wrote this thesis, he was obsessed with Hooyer Hill because, believe it or not, <coughs> if you go to Belgium, Mal or in Malmody, Belgium, they're obsessed with World War II. They have museums everywhere, except this. this is, nothing is known about this. There's, there's nothing except there's this very small little monument of the names of a handful of 526 B Company men that were killed in that field. It was actually erected by some Belgian families that actually helped collect some of the bodies. Um, so what ends up happening is, as they come to that hill, uh, the half-tracks can't go up the hill. It's, the snow's too deep, and it's too slick, and they, they dismount, and they quite literally walk directly up a hill into 
multiple machine gun nests. And as things are falling apart, it ends up that they walk up about halfway. Now this, this was a heck of a story for, uh, for Mahaffey to tell me. They get up about halfway up that hill, and uh, they think that they're actually going to make it, because halfway up the hill is the machine gun nest. They don't know that there's more machine gun nests on the actual top of the hill. They say they, they got to about halfway, they took heavy fire, and they got repelled back. And that's where Mahaffey and uh, some of uh, the people he was with, uh, I think Robert Black, Sergeant Robert Black, watched as a German soldier uh, rummage through the bodies of what I believe to be a soldier named uh, Oliver Love and took a pocket watch or some form of watch off of him. And I guess that made them incredibly furious and they pushed up the hill and got finally to that second machine gun nest and they, uh, the Germans surrendered except one that according to him didn't surrender but did not make it for sure. And uh, they took the pocket watch back, and they got into an argument on this hill. This was a big deal. Uh, I guess they were going to shoot the German prisoners, because, by the way, that happens a lot in war. All right, uh, if, you're, if you hate your enemy and you've seen what they've done to you, you kill your, you kill your prisoners. This happens. Americans do it. Germans do it. Every, everybody's doing it. And so they, they're going to do it. And a couple of the guys say, don't, we, don't do it. So, I don't think we should do this. Um, I, I think uh, there might be more of them. If we shoot them and we get captured, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're not getting captured. And so they decide not to, and they send them back down the hill, and that's when the Germans kind of show that they have more machine gun nests and more people, and they make a push on them, and they capture just about everybody but a handful of people. And they don't kill their prisoners because the Americans didn't kill their prisoners. Very lucky on that. But a couple of them lay down pretending to be dead. A lot of them lay down and pretend to be dead. Uh, because they'd already been fighting over that hill for about an hour, an hour and a half, uh, bodies are just littered on, the, on this you know, hillside. And out of the 200, there seems to be about only 65 or so that are even left. Um, and so here, uh, many men opt to just kind of lay down and pretend to be dead. One of those, I do believe, is W.D. Hurt, who's a Weezer native who, who who's lays down with a lot of the other guys and tries not to get captured. Uh, luckily, Lincoln Mahaffey, he actually gets back to his half track. He was already halfway down that hill. He took the pocket watch. He was the guy that actually took the pocket watch that they got off the German back, and he walked back to the... Uh, um, half track so that he could send it to the guy's mother because the half track driver was kind of going to be the guy that was in charge of all that because he generally stayed with the half track so he had a little book um, which had all the addresses that all the guys wrote their names in in case anything happened to them because again the half track driver usually doesn't get out of the half track too often uh, WD's herd's name is in there it's right on the first couple pages actually so as he walks back that's when the advance seems to happen uh, he doesn't get captured, uh, just about everybody else does get captured or killed, and they last for a couple hours before the Germans finally discover that uh, WD and a lot of the other guys are indeed not dead, or you know they're, they're hiding but they get found, um, and they get captured. Now, this is near the end of the story, so hopefully I've kept your attention for somewhat this whole time. Uh, very fascinating, um, and this tells you something about human will. Uh, these soldiers have been fighting uh, for only a couple hours, but it's some of the most intense fighting that you could probably ever imagine. And then they are walked up the hill, um, and a German officer who speaks English sits down with them and is like, why, why, would, you, why would you send your troops up here? But why, who, who sent you to do this? This is insane. Uh, apparently they were, they were shocked. They had no idea who gave them the information to run up that hill. Um, and the Germans said, well, we're Apparently the German officer was just impressed, like, wow, uh, you know, uh, good, uh, interesting move. Uh, you fought well, I guess. And uh, they load them up in the back of a truck um, and moved them to a little, uh, 
I guess, a, a collection of houses. It wasn't that far away, actually. And they kept them up for hours, they interrogated them over and over again, trying to figure out why they were trying to be sent to this hill. Because they, they made no sense. And they didn't know why they were sent to the hill. They thought it was an observation post. And uh, so they're kept up for hours, and then it ends up way too late. Some artillery barrages hit the hill, and the Germans are experiencing pretty heavy losses. And uh, later that night, you know, the Germans have been up all day. They just experienced a pretty heavy artillery barrage. There was hard fighting. The Americans just experienced the worst moments of their lives and um, are then interrogated. A handful of them see an opening as some of the, uh, the young German soldiers that were guarding them. A couple of them fall asleep. And I got this from a handwritten account from a guy named Harold, Mag uh, Harold Magnuson, who was with W.D. Hurd. And a guy reached out and said he knew Harold when he was a kid, and Harold had given him some stuff, and he mailed it to me. It was a book and some handwritten accounts and stuff like that. And in it, Harold explains that he uh, they saw the opening really late in the night, and all the other guys had pretty much fallen asleep. And Harold tried uh, to, to basically push himself as hard as he could. And they walk out of the tent, him and a couple of other guys, which I now know is heard and uh, they end up coming across and I guess he wishes he never came across this but uh, a, uh, a radio tent it was empty it was heated uh, and it was the warmest they'd been all day and uh, Magnuson just collapses he can't he can't get up he was so cold uh, he just collapses from exhaustion in there and he's warm for the first time and he just goes to sleep um, W.D. doesn't. W.D. gets back, uh, walks what I assume is a, a pretty scary walk behind German lines back to the town of Malmody where he runs into John Senden from Weezer <laughs> and says, John, I, I, I just got, uh, I got captured <laughs> by the Germans. And that's the story from what I understand it. Harold, uh, he tries to escape multiple times. Uh, but he never does. He ends up getting liberated way later at the end of the war in April 1945. But WD and only a handful of guys from B Company make it back, uh, and they never talk about it. I found only a couple of people that were ever willing to talk about this. There was a guy named Richard Stone who also got captured. He wrote a, a small paper, a very small paper about what happened. There was a guy named uh, Flores. He tries to write about it, very small and there's Harold, and the rest of the guys won't talk about it at all. Um, from, my, from what I understand, uh, not only was that just incredibly traumatic, um, the scenery and the smells, and they never forgot it. Uh, apparently there's a lot of uh, pine trees. A lot of these guys mention, not all of them, a lot of them seem to mention, that uh, they would never get a Christmas tree ever again because of the smell of those pine trees. So I don't know if he ever said anything about that, but a handful of them said that. But uh, it was quite incredible what they went through. In Lincoln, when I brought it up to Lincoln and I said the word, uh, who your hell, he just looked at me. He was shocked because it's not in any book. You'll never read about who your hell. It was a failed attack. Um, but they found out later that it did serve a purpose. It turns out the Army did know that it was not an observation post. But they figured that if they made an attack there that just seemed kind of insane, that the Germans would think, okay, there's, there's something going on. And it was supposed to be a diversion while the real attack would happen from the 30th Infantry Division um, in a different spot a couple hours later. And it worked. They sacrificed B Company in order for that to work. So there's a rough little story for you to end it out. Uh, there's all kinds of information I have on these guys. After the war, they go wild. They, I mean, I learned everything from, like, these guys are like smuggling booze from Belgium to Germany to sell it on the black market. The, they open up um, what I assume to be an extremely illegal nightclub in Germany uh, where they make little specialized passes to get into, which is pretty cool. Um, one guy named uh, Scriparelli from uh, New York, one of the few guys from New York, he uh, ends up making a lot of money running little gambling uh, 
uh, interesting little gambling circles where uh, when he comes back, he uh, there's a story that I have written down where he approaches a soldier named uh, Mario Estrada with $5,000 cash. And he says, uh, I split up my money uh, to a couple of my friends, and uh, as we go back into the States, I'd really appreciate it if you guys, if you could hold on to this. And he split that money up. I don't know if you guys know $5,000 is in 1945, but uh, so there's, there's more stories is what I'm telling you here. But, there, but I'm going to end it there uh, because those stories will be told another time in a different exhibit. I hope I've uh, caught your ear and told you something you've never heard before. This was a little nerve-wracking for me because I didn't expect so many people. <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed it and I hope uh, you look at this stuff and uh, you can be proud of what these user natives did and uh, what the 526 did uh, for victory in the Second World War so, in the European theater. So there you go. Yeah.